I think. Very good. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's uh, Quantum Information Science Colloquium here at the Advanced Quantum Testbed. It is an absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Jens Koch from Northwestern University. Uh, as I was mentioning before the recording, the first time I remember meeting Jens was at a reasonably good Thai restaurant in New Haven, Connecticut called Bangkok Garden, in which he was telling me about uh, his previous life at the Freie Universität in Berlin, uh, after which he was at Yale, uh, making numerous contributions to superconducting qubits uh, that we are living off of and still trying to understand the details of today going forward. And he's going to give us today a very interesting talk saying trans bonds aren't forever. I guess diamond and V's are also not forever, but trans bonds are not forever. Realizing advanced error protection in superconducting qubits. So this is a topic we've been thinking about how to engineer circuits that are more complex than a, a simple trans bond, which of course has the, the beauty and utility of being used everywhere, but it requires perfection and many other things. So it's absolutely a pleasure to have Jens with us today. And I pass the, the lectern over to Jens for his colloquium. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you're very generous and I'm, I'm suitably embarrassed. Uh, it, it, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And I'll try to next share my screen. Uh, that should be number two. And there we go. All right. So I wasn't sure whether or not this, this title would at all be uh, uh, sort of provocative or not, but um, I, I, I'll explain what I mean by that and, and what I had in mind uh, when, when coming up with that title. And, and overall, what I would uh, what I would like to do with this talk is is in fact um, uh, in the first half to uh, introduce this this concept and and some of the ideas of intrinsic error protection. And I'll try and explain why I think uh, this this might be a useful direction to follow in, in research. Um, and then part two, you know, if part one is, is uh, sort of boring and you're, you're married to the trans one and, and not really willing to give it up, then I, I think part two might, might still be helpful. Uh, in that part, I will talk a little bit about uh, this open source package SC qubits that uh, we, we have published uh, now a while ago. And I'll introduce you to that and, and some of the more, more recent functionality that we've added. Now, all of this work uh, is, is done uh, together with people in my own group. Uh, this is an, a pretty old photo by now. Um, and then uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, Andrew Hauck uh, does the experiments at Princeton. Dave Schuster is, is over just uh, sort of down the road at University of Chicago. Uh, David Ferguson is a former postdoc of mine who's now at Northrop Grumman. And uh, most of you must know Alexandre Blais. So they were all part of one or another project that uh, goes, goes into, into this talk. Great, and I'll try to see whether PowerPoint is going to allow me to use this little laser pointer gadget. I hope you can see that. So transmonts aren't forever. There's of course the, the, the simple truth that their T1 is, is finite and, and that's uh, not, not a mystery and that's uh, sort of a trivial statement, but, but maybe there's more, uh, there is more that I want to express with that. So, so the first one is sort of historical just uh, to, to point out that this thing, uh, if you were, relatively new to the field, this thing has been around for a good while, right? Uh, this was born, this transmont qubit was born in 2007. And um, perhaps just to entertain Irfan Siddiqui a little bit, I, I, I dug out some of, the, some of the photos that document how people actually looked back then. Uh, so, so here are uh, some of the, the big names that uh, are, are behind this qubit. So Michel Devore, Steve Gervin, Rob Shalkop, and uh, if, if none of you know Luigi Funzio, he's the person who was and still is in charge of uh, uh, much of the fabrication of, of these devices. Um, and why he likes to eat heavy cream out of, out of the pack, I, I'm not sure. But it, it was definitely a, a fun time back then. Um, and uh, so, so indeed, this, this device has been around for a while. And, and before I comment more on why uh, it, it might be interesting to, to look a little bit farther and in different directions. I, I should first make sure that we, that we really all are familiar uh, with, with what this transform qubit is. So I have uh, one slide where uh, quite a few of you may, may want to go to sleep or, or look at emails for a bit, um, but I want to make sure that um, uh, those who are not working with transforms every day are, are comfortable uh, with, with what this is. 
And the, the simple starting point really is, is just an LC oscillator. Uh, so an L and a, and a C coupled to each other. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is that if you build this circuit out of superconducting material, uh, then there are good reasons to actually think of the system as a, as a quantum system. Uh, and so we, we write down uh, a Hamiltonian that uh, should look familiar. There's a term for the electrostatic charging energy uh, with Q being the charge on this capacitor with capacitance C. And then there's an inductive term with uh, phi being the flux through this uh, inductor with inductance L. And um, uh, lo and behold, if uh, we take uh, our little step from classical to quantum mechanics, this flux and the charge become uh, non-commuting operators. And you know, once the dust settles, it is a harmonic oscillator. So it uh, is not a surprise to anybody that uh, you get the usual form um, of, of a quantum harmonic oscillator and an energy spectrum that has these equidistant energy levels. And if you're interested in producing something that might work well as a qubit, then a harmonic oscillator by itself is, is difficult to operate um, precisely because all the energy levels are equidistant. And so uh, the, the trick is to, to use some kind of nonlinearity and then hopefully the kind that doesn't produce dissipation. And uh, in the context of superconductors, the, the thing that comes to mind is, is a Josephson junction. And so instead of this, this parabolic potential that we encountered for the harmonic oscillator, this Josephson junction now produces a cosine uh, potential uh, like shown here. Um, but, but then at the end of the day, the, the parameter regime in which uh, this, this transmon circuit is operated is, is such that um, the bound states, if you will, uh, are sort of localized deep inside this well. And if you squint your eyes a little bit, then close to the bottom of the well, this of course looks just like a parabola. So we might just attempt to expand the cosine to leading order, we recover our harmonic oscillator. And then if we go to next uh, uh, higher order, then we will discover that there are corrections to the parabolic shape of this potential, of course. And so there's, uh, there's another term that uh, can be written in this form. Uh, and it just says that, hey, there's anharmonicity. So these energy levels are not uh, quite equidistant. Uh, and that um, turns out is, is enough to, to operate the circuit as a pretty, pretty good qubit. And in, in real life, um, uh, actually a rather recent example from the Hauk lab, a transmon might look like that. So you have these two big pads, which are the, the two plates of your capacitor. And then uh, in the middle here, we would have to zoom in to really see what's going on. But this is where the connection is made between the two capacitor pads. And that's where the junction is located. And, and so when you look at it, it, it really is a very simple circuit. Uh, and it is easy for a theorist to say that it's simple to fabricate. Uh, I understand there are lots of things that can go wrong in fabrication. I've uh, uh, appreciated that uh, listening to Luigi Frunzio, who shared his office with me while I was at Yale. Um, but there are much more difficult things to fabricate uh, when it comes to that. That much I've also learned. Um, and so in, in that sense, this, the circuit is, is quite attractive. Um, and of course, over the years, it, it has been highly optimized. People have learned what things to avoid, both in fabrication and in, uh, in how we operate it. Um, and what's re really wonderful about it, and um, I will come back to that, is that uh, this is a circuit that uh, is not sensitive or very little sensitive to charge noise, uh, one, one of the worst noise sources out there uh, that, that tends to, to kill quantumness in, in these circuits otherwise. And uh, what, what I would like to point out as a sort of a drawback is that even though uh, the depolarization times, the T1 times uh, have uh, been increased uh, magnificently over the years, intrinsically the circuit has no protection from T1 processes whatsoever. And so there is a question in my mind, um, can, we, can we do better? Is, is this really, uh, the answer that we've been looking for, uh, and, and perhaps uh, more, more pragmatically, will this circuit be the one that is sufficient to actually get us eventually out of uh, this NISC era uh, and, and make uh, significant progress? Um, and I think that's, that's probably a question that, that many of you uh, ponder, and um, I, you know, how, how, do we, how do we do this? And um, 
So that is in, in part my, my motivation for, for wondering whether uh, someday maybe the transmon also wants to retire. Um, and uh, the question is, well, if so, then, then what, might, what might be a replacement? What, what could work better possibly? And so I'll, I'll start this um, uh, with a simple discussion of um, what, what does protection mean and protection from what? It's a, it's a basic introduction, um, but I, I, I learned that in, in colloquia, and that, that's usually a, a good thing to do in the beginning. So again, uh, the experts just bear with me, uh, take care of your email inbox, uh, and, and uh, we'll get to more, more nitty gritty stuff. So the, the place uh, that, that I would like to use for, for starting this motivation is, um, you know, why do we need uh, error protection? And um, the, the fact is that no qubit uh, is really ever alone in the universe. Every qubit couples, uh, hopefully weakly, uh, to uncontrolled degrees of freedom in the environment. For superconducting qubits, um, there's a variety of important noise channels uh, that are known, uh, one over charge noise, flux noise, and so on. And when I say known, I, I mean we know that they are there, uh, but we don't necessarily understand very well what their microscopic origin is. Um, I, I think there's still uh, much to be learned uh, in, in that direction. And the presence of noise tends to reduce how quantum our quantum bit really is. Uh, so this loss of quantumness or, or decoherence limits gate, fidel gate fidelities, uh, and it ultimately leads to errors in the execution of a quantum algorithm. So without some strategy for mitigating those errors, a future quantum computer uh, would just keep crashing with um, a blue screen maybe. If, if the operating system is like Windows, then uh, the blue screen might look like this, right? Your qubit ran into a problem that it couldn't handle and now it needs to restart. Uh, and so we need to try and rescue HBAR from this horrible death. Um, and uh, we'll, um, we'll do that uh, in a moment, but I'll, I'll quickly remind us of uh, the, the two primary modes of decoherence that we need to consider in, in this context. So first of all, there's de depolarization uh, with a characteristic time scale of T1. And in the simplest uh, case, depolarization corresponds to just spontaneous relaxation of the qubit state uh, of the one state to, to the zero state uh, like this. And the rate at which this occurs can be uh, in the simplest cases uh, that we're familiar with um, can be computed by Fermi's golden rule. Uh, so this involves the, the noise spectral density S of omega evaluated at, uh, at the qubit frequency omega q. And then there's a transition matrix element where this operator A is in fact the operator by which the, the qubit couples to the environment, uh, to, to the bath in, in question. And then on the side of, of pure dephasing, uh, we can picture uh, the origin of that as noise induced by slow fluctuations of the qubit frequency, uh, right? So there are random fluctuations that uh, have the effect of, of scrambling the, the relative phases uh, in, in, our, uh, in our states. Uh, so this is here uh, represented as a density matrix. Uh, you see that uh, the off-diagonal elements uh, uh, approach zero un under such uh, pure dephasing. And uh, the, the corresponding rate uh, can generally be written uh, in, in this form, where now it's the noise power spectrum at very low frequencies that matters. Uh, and it's the, the sensitivity of the qubit splitting of the, of the qubit frequency with respect to our fluctuating parameter lambda uh, that matters. So if, uh, if, these ener if this energy splitting uh, is is uh, insensitive, and th then the derivative is small, and we get a uh, we get a small dephasing rate and a large uh, T phi. Good. Now, over the years, uh, there have been uh, various attempts to to mitigate errors, and um, I think we can distinguish a, a couple of uh, qualitatively different strategies. So, strategy one. Uh, is a little bit like you turn down the volume of the noise itself. Uh, you really reduce the noise amplitude. You, you modify S of omega. And um, that's something that is hard work, uh, I think. Um, in some places that will require material science, uh, it might involve uh, rethinking parts of your fabrication. Uh, uh, microwave engineering has been very successful in, in uh, uh, reducing noise in, in certain aspects. 
Um, and then point two is uh, a little bit different in that we, we accept uh, that there is, is noise, but we, we try and become a little bit deaf to it. Uh, so, so this intrinsic noise protection uh, is, is really a matter of uh, let's, let's try and modify our circuit um, to, to make it insensitive to those noise sources that we fear most. Um, and that uh, might entail thinking about how the system couples to, to the bath. Uh, can we modify these matrix elements and make them small? And then on the side of pure dephasing, the question becomes, can we make our qubit uh, levels insensitive to those fluctuating noise parameters? And then I'll skip over autonomous error correction, which is sort of in between, but then at the very end over here is perhaps what, uh, what we ultimately will will need, uh, and which is active quantum error correction, uh, which, which in this little caricature is, is like your noise canceling headphone, right? There's a, there's a feedback loop and you actually have to actively monitor for errors in a, in a clever way. And then uh, without learning what the system is actually doing in detail and then apply correction steps uh, whenever required. And so, as as you already uh, as you already anticipate, my, my talk is going to focus on on this middle point here, intrinsic noise protection. And um, uh, you all know noise protection in in one form or another. In in fact, um, the kind of noise protection that I'm interested in, you've you've seen uh, most likely in in different qubits. Um, and uh, I'll I'll talk about that kind of partial protection for for a moment. The transmon that we uh, touched on already is, is partially protected. Um, so is the flux qubit. Um, and uh, what I mean by that um, is, is easily explained. So I'll start on the side of, of the transmon. Um, same thing as the Cooper pair box, just uh, a, you know, a, a variation in, in the parameter regime uh, at which this, this circuit is, is operated. And so when you, when you look at this, um, this now has this uh, superconducting island, a piece of superconducting metal up here um, that is connected to, to ground only through the junction and the big shunting capacitor. And uh, we can imagine that we, we can try to influence the electrostatic potential um, of, this, of this island uh, through a gate voltage. Um, turns out that nature uh, does, does that itself, but not in a very controlled way. So, so there's... Um, uh, th th there are there might be fluctuating charges in the vicinity of, of the circuit. Uh, wh whatever it is, it, it uh, produces a, a random uh, uh, gate voltage, and uh, that is typically of one over f type. And uh, we we like to encode the, the influence of this of this gate voltage in terms of uh, an offset charge. It's it's a dimensionless parameter uh, which which just characterizes the uh, the, this charge offset here on this island. Uh, and you see it's a noisy, a noisy one over F signal as a function of time. And what does it do to our qubit? Now, if we plot the low-lying energy levels of the circuit, uh, you see the ground state here as a function of this offset charge, the first excited state and so on. Um, then a variation in this offset charge is uh, is equivalent to wiggling this operating point on the x-axis, which I've tried to visualize here. Uh, and uh, so that means that the energy splitting of the qubit is changing, and that is precisely uh, what we said uh, is going to lead to dephasing. Now, what the transmon does very well um, is, to, is to harness a, a very simple observation, in, in fact, which is if we if we consider this energy spectrum that you saw a moment ago, and we play with basically the one single parameter that we can play with in the sim simple circuit, namely the energy ratio that determines how strong is Josephson uh, tunneling as compared to the, the effect of charging, uh, electrostatic charging, then if we increase this EJ over EC ratio, we notice that these energy levels become rather flat. In fact, here uh, at the resolution that I'm showing, uh, we, we can't even see anymore that there are still variations and, and they are exponentially suppressed. And that means that this derivative of the qubit energy with respect to the offset charge is exponentially small. So charge noise is not going to harm us. The, the contribution to the full dephasing rate from charge noise is, is negligible. And that really helped um, the, the case of the circuit because the 
the original form of the circuit as, as a Kupiker box was very short-lived in, in terms of coherence, uh, ju just a few nanoseconds perhaps. And, and that was uh, really too small to do much, uh, any, anything useful really with that circuit. Um, so there is protection uh, as far as purity phasing from charge noise is concerned. But when it comes to depolarization, then this uh, the circuit and, and the corresponding potential and the wave functions really look very, very similar to a harmonic oscillator. And in a harmonic oscillator, you will find that, well, uh, the first excited state is going to readily relax to the ground state. Uh, typically, selection rules are such that you have to hop from one uh, step of the ladder to the next lower one, but there's uh, no suppression of this matrix element whatsoever. And so in that sense, the transmon is partially protected. It's not protected uh, from depolarization, but it has some nice protection from dephasing due to charge noise. We can turn this around. Uh, we can switch to a slightly different circuit. Um, you can call it uh, heavy fluxonium, uh, but, but really it's, it's the same as, as the old, good old fashioned flux qubit, uh, which has a somewhat different potential energy, uh, which might look like a, an asymmetric double well. And in this case, it's not hard to imagine, right, that the wave functions for, for the ground state and for the first excited state, they localize in, in these adjacent wells. And um, so, so language dictates that I shouldn't say that they have no overlap, because uh, that, that's in fact a property that all eigen, eigenfunctions satisfy. They're all orthogonal. Oh, and somebody is drawing. That's excellent. If, if there's a question uh, or, or I can help somehow, I, I, I'd be happy to. So, sometimes it's actually the cat that, that makes drawings. I've, I've seen that before as well. But so these wave functions are naturally orthogonal, but more importantly, they have nearly disjoint support. Where by, by support, uh, I, I mean the region in which they're significantly different from, from zero. And disjoint just means that, well, they're localized in sort of spatially separate regions. And what that means is that the depolarization rate, which uh, depends on this, on, on a matrix element like this, is going to be exponentially suppressed. Um, I don't know whether people are bothered by the blue lines. I could try to remove them, but um, uh, there's maybe. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying. Yeah, that, you... that's, that's all right. I... Yeah, if you're annotating, clear the annotation. I, I can't clear it, but. I can clear too, I think. Yeah, I got it. All right. Okay. We're not protected against lines. Not protected against lines either. That's right. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not very coherent either, but that's a different topic. So back to the matrix elements. Um, you, you see that if I write out this matrix element in, in uh, phi and in, in sort of position representation, if you will, then, uh, well, I have an operator A in the middle, but as long as it just depends on phi and, and perhaps on, on uh, the derivative, but, but not to infinite order, maybe, maybe just the first or second derivative or such, then this product here consists of, of two pieces which are non-zero in different regions. So this entire integral is going to be very small. And, that, and that's, the, that, that's the mechanism why for flux qubits and, and today in, in the modern heavy fluxonia, um, the, 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 you, you can have very long T1s. Uh, right, this uh, this uh, rate is suppressed. The T1 is long, um, and what's uh, what's great um, is uh, well, you have now the, the opposite kind of protection. You have T1 protection. What's not so great is that uh, you've bought that at the expense um, of uh, lack of uh, dephasing protection, uh, because if you look at what uh, the energy levels do in a flux qubit as a function of flux then you see they vary quite a bit. Um, in, in fact, noticing that how small this, this range in external flux is, this is in units of flux quanta, uh, this, this variation is quite significant. There, there's a huge lever arm, if you will, between, uh, between, these two, be, between these two minima and the potential. And that means there is no protection from dephasing due to one over F flux noise. Now, what do we do? Uh, as, as oftentimes in life, we, we actually want both, right? We want uh, to have the situation of disjoint support for our computational qubit states. And we want pure dephasing to be suppressed at the same 
time, uh, meaning that we would like our qubit energy splitting to be uh, to, to have variations as small as possible uh, when it comes to uh, the dependence on the relevant fluctuating parameters. And um, uh, so, so how to achieve this is, is a good question. There are um, a num number of ideas where this is uh, related to a near degeneracy of the ground state. Um, but but if if you came up with a with a nice method that that kept this at, kept this at uh, at large energies, but but still the, the levels are as flat as uh, you might have seen for for the transmon, then that would be perfectly perfectly fine as well. And so how do we how do we do this? How do we get uh, the the best of those those two sides? And this is a question that people uh, have considered for a good while. Um, maybe one of the early papers that was really important to, uh, to go uh, and, and start this, this uh, line of research was, was Kitayev's uh, paper on the current mirror. Um, and, and since then, there has been a lot of work by uh, Joffe and Dussault and uh, Misha Gershenson uh, has, has done experiments in that direction. Um, I'm not doing a good job uh, giving you a comprehensive list here. Um, but there is, in fact, uh, a, a recent uh, uh, archive preprint print, uh, that, that gives a review uh, on, on, uh, on the literature and, and on uh, directions going forward. And so the, the, the qubit, perhaps in this context that um, my group has worked on uh, most is, is the zero pi qubit, um, which has recently, rather recently, also been implemented in its first prototype version in an experiment. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit more about that, um, which I think will give you uh, a hint as to how, how difficult some of this is um, and, and um, how things that work well on paper uh, don't automatically work well in experiments. Um, I think to all experimentalists in the audience, that's sort of a trivial statement, but sometimes it's a surprise for theorists and something that we have, have to be taught sometimes over and over again. Now, before I really try to go into the details of the of the zero pi qubit, I thought I would tell you a, a quick story here that um, I've told before, um, but but I should warn you that I think some of it has to be taken with a little bit little grain of salt. It's not completely rigorous that, that there's some hand waving involved, but it's maybe some good food for thought. So this cosine potential you've seen before, it's uh, what I said makes up uh, the, the potential energy for, for the transmon. And um, there are different ways to think about this cosine. Um, I've, I've drawn it here in, in this phi basis and the position basis, if you will. But if you go into the momentum basis, then you will discover that this momentum basis actually consists of discrete charge states. And since uh, you can only move Cooper pairs one by one and not in, in sort of little uh, fractional packages, um, this cosine actually boils down to a nice representation of what Josephson tunneling is, right? You can uh, transfer a Cooper pair across the junction and thereby increase the number of Cooper pairs on one side of the junction by one or vice versa. And then, um, you know, in, in the typical interpretation, I would say that, well, um, this cosine uh, really just has one single minimum. And uh, in, in, a, in a way, this, this wraps around in a circle such that once you've gone from zero to two pi, you've actually uh, gone round uh, once so, so that there's no more minima to discover. So, so there's this one, uh, and uh, that's all. And the one idea to produce disjoint support, wave functions that localize in, in separate wells would be to say, well, we, we need a second well. That, that's, uh, that's clear. Uh, we, we might even need to make it just slightly asymmetric so that localization takes place in the way that I've drawn here. Otherwise, I would get symmetric and anti-symmetric superpositions. Um, and if we ask, well, what, what does this actually correspond to, then I can sort of play a similar game as for the Cooper pair tunneling. I can I can uh, use Euler's formula and uh, rewrite my cosine. Uh, this time I get e to the two i phi. And this two uh, is in fact what, what goes into the number by which the Cooper pair uh, uh, n, the number n, index n, changes in this process. So, so what we're drawing here is, is an example of, of some fictitious 
circuit element that we don't know how to make, uh, at least not uh, by, by a single element. We, we have some ideas how to compose it out of multiple elements, perhaps. Um, but this is an element that would let only two Cooper pairs tunnel and, and not, not one at a time. And um, so the, the, the real hand waving comes now where we'll try to motivate that maybe the zero pi circuit, the zero pi qubit does something like that. So this is one way of drawing the circuit of this device. Um, it has uh, four nodes uh, and uh, there's uh, two capacitors, two Josephson junctions, two inductors. And the one thing that, that we'll have to remember is that um, for the circuit to work the way we want it to work, we'll have to think of these inductors as being rather large. Um, I'm not going to say large compared to watts, but, but uh, the safe thing is to almost imagine that we're taking the limit of, of these uh, inductances to go to infinity. And if I do that, then I can ask, well, what, um, what would happen if I were to take a Cooper pair from the top left uh, node here and uh, hop it across this junction down to the bottom left? Uh, clearly, I get some, some sort of charge imbalance, and that charge imbalance looks strange because there's now some negative charge on this capacitor, some positive charge on this capacitor plate, and, and this uh, certainly looks energetically unfavorable, and there, there will have to be some balancing uh, that will have to follow. And so I could, I could say, well, um, clearly, if, um, if this was just a wire down here, I could just have the negative charge uh, flow a little bit further, and then things don't look that bad energetically anymore. Uh, but these inductors are so large that that's not the route to take, uh, right? We said those inductances are very large, uh, so uh, current flow is, is suppressed. And the next best thing that I can try and consider is, well, let's hop another Cooper pair across the other junction, in which case there will be more charge imbalance, but uh, this charge imbalance is such that now the two capacitors have uh, equal positive and negative charges on both sides. So that doesn't look quite that crazy anymore. And um, it, in that somewhat fuzzy sense, uh, I, I could say that this device is, is a device in which Cooper pairs want to co-tunnel uh, in, in two different junctions uh, at the same time. And um, I'll be happy to, to answer questions about that or, or reveal that I, I myself uh, find certain aspects of, of that story lacking, but, but it's a story that, that is worth pondering. So, so let's look at this in, in more detail and how one would actually analyze this, this circuit. Um, and I will pair that with, um, uh, with sort of images of what the real device uh, would in fact look like. Um, and um, this is what it would look like, at least in in, in an artist's representation, sort of. Um, so there are two big capacitors uh, over on the left, bottom left and top right. Um, these big inductors are actually fabricated uh, as, as junction arrays. And then in these two positions are, are our Josephson junctions. And uh, we can quickly convince ourselves that um, in, in fact, uh, this, this is the same circuit. Uh, so let, let's do that real quick. I think I made my little drawings here. So I'll mark the two capacitor plates uh, of this capacitor A and B, and I'll do the same over here. And then uh, there's uh, the other capacitor, I'll call that one and two. Those are over on the right. And then let's quickly check connections, right? So B connects to plate one. Uh, so B connects to plate one by an inductor, which is the array. So that's this connection. And then uh, B connects to play two through a junction. Uh, that is this connection here where you see this wire goes to the back and thereby connects over to two. And um, in the interest of time, I will just flash the other two, uh, but this all works out. So uh, the Hauk lab did a fantastic job of building this device. And if you analyze it, um, it, uh, it has four nodes. Um, so it has multiple modes, uh, if you were to uh, linearize the circuit, then um, those would be the normal modes. And um, they're interesting because they, they sort of represent some of the simple circuit that we're familiar with. So there's a, a theta mode, we call it, uh, which um, looks a little bit like a transmon. And uh, since we are worried about charge sensitivity, we, we would make to, want to make sure that EJ is large compared to EC. 
And then there's the fluxonium-like mode involving the junction arrays. And to make it insensitive uh, with respect to flux noise, we'll want to make sure that these uh, inductances are quite large. And then there's this odd one out, uh, which is the harmonic degree of freedom. And the original paper in which the zero pi qubit was introduced, uh, which uh, uh, is by, by Brooks, Kitaev, and Preskill, uh, that never, that they never mentioned this mode. Um, and uh, there's, there's by now quite a bit of history of uh, do we have to be afraid of this mode or not. Um, and um, I, I'll probably say a few words um, if I don't run out of time before. But um, uh, it, it's, it's an important aspect that, um, that was missing in, in the proposal, in the original proposal. And so just um, perhaps to flash this, I'm not going to bother you with going through this Hamiltonian in full detail. Perhaps the, the message is, uh, for, for those of you who are not experts, that there's a systematic procedure in which we go from drawing such a little circuit to writing down a Hamiltonian that, uh, that describes that circuit in, in detail. Uh, what's perhaps better for, for the sake of this talk is to look at the potential energy, um, which is now a two-dimensional potential energy landscape uh, of the variables theta and phi. And uh, again, it has a shape that um, in along the phi direction resembles what we would expect for a fluxonium circuit, uh, right? It's a shallow parabola with a cosine modulation on top. And in theta direction, I'm only drawing one period because it's periodic, just like a, like a transmon would be. And um, in, in my language, without uh, now waving my hands and talking about double Cooper pair tunneling, what, what I would, how I would describe, um, we, we try to design uh, the, the, the regime for this device is such that wave functions spread out along the phi direction. They, they should delocalize in this direction, which helps us make, make the states flux insensitive. Um, but then we would like to, for, for the two computational states, to have just joint support. So we'll set things up so that one wave function localizes along theta equals zero, and the other wave function localizes uh, along theta equals pi. Um, and we can, we can achieve that by making the mass of the, this fictitious particle living in this potential quite different in vertical versus horizontal direction. So it's going to have a light mass in horizontal and a heavy mass in vertical direction. Uh, and those masses are actually governed by the capacitances in the circuit and, and the experimentalists know how to change those. And so indeed, um, what, what happens at the end of the day is you, you get these, uh, these wonderful ground state and first excited state wave functions. They, they localize as they should. And we can indeed check in detail uh, do, do, doing calculations uh, for, for predicting coherence times um, and, and such to, to verify that um, this looks very much like the kind of protected qubit that, that we've been after. Now, Monica or Irfan, um, I didn't pay great attention uh, as to what was the, the, the exact time when I started. Can you give me uh, either a, a feel for how long do I still have or a warning of some kind? Sure, we'd like to sort of finish up in about you know 15 minutes. So maybe if you leave a few minutes for questions, that'd be great. If that works. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, and so I said that this, this zero pi circuit uh, has, has a little bit of history by now. Um, the original idea uh, came from Brooks, K. Taif, and Preskill in 2013. And um, since then, there, there have been uh, a lot of questions of how do we perform gates in the circuit? Because gates become more difficult when the circuit is protected. Um, before the gates, we were very worried about what I've called this zeta mode. Um, and I can say a few words about that. Um, I mentioned that um, it's a harmonic degree of freedom. It's, it's basically a little oscillator that is uh, built into the circuit, but it's not something that we actually wanted. Um, and it's potentially detrimental because in the parameter regime that we need for the zero pi circuit to work, uh, that oscillator sits at low frequencies. In the experiment, I think it sits uh, just around 700 megahertz. Um, and if that circuit, if that, sorry, that degree of freedom, uh, this data mode, if it was perfectly decoupled from our 
primary qubit degrees of freedom, then life would be good. If it was decoupled, then who cares? But it's not quite decoupled. Um, it, it couples whenever there is a disorder between the parameters of your two uh, Josephson junction arrays uh, and or the two big shunting capacitors. And of course, fabrication will always produce some sort of disorder in, in this, uh, of this kind. And so there is a concern about dephasing uh, due to photon shot noise. Uh, so uh, whenever a photon enters uh, this, this zeta mode oscillator, uh, there might be a small frequency shift on the qubit. And uh, if, those, uh, if, if the rate of photons entering is too large or the shift is, is, uh, is too large, then uh, that is indeed a, a major concern for, for dephasing of, of the zero pi uh, circuit. Now on paper, it turns out this, this works. Uh, uh, you can find parameters in which uh, theorists' predictions, our predictions in this case, uh, are look, look fantastic, uh, right? Uh, so a T1 of 10 seconds and the T5 of 20 milliseconds is maybe it's almost too much. Uh, you'd have to think hard about how to, how to do a reset. Um, you don't want to wait for 10 seconds. Um, but those of you who are familiar with um, sort of typical values for, for an inductin, inductive energy, uh, this looks quite crazy. Um, and, uh, and indeed, in the experiment, what, what has been achieved is outside of this parameter regime. But I think we see some of the things working in the experiment, even though it doesn't achieve full protection yet. Uh, so in, in the Hauk Labs experiment, um, the, the T1 is uh, 1.5 milliseconds. Um, and the T5 is not that great, right? Uh, no, nobody today is, is really impressed with, uh, with 25 microseconds. And the reason for that is, is as I said, um, we can't uh, quite reach this, this deep zero pi regime where the inductance is really, really large. Um, and the consequence of that is that the wave functions actually do not spread out along the phi direction as much as we would like to. Uh, so in the experiment, the operation is simply looking at the flux sweet spot, which is by no means as good as the exponentially uh, suppressed uh, sensitivity to flux noise that uh, one would really like to achieve uh, in, in this circuit. And so on the, on the theory side, there, there are plenty of challenges, uh, some of which have to do with how, you know, if, if, uh, if we make more progress on fabricating devices that are uh, even uh, th that are truly protected, how would we perform gates? Um, and uh, does that involve temporarily lifting the protection? Does it, um, does it perhaps uh, work if we go through higher levels that uh, we, we typ typically don't think of? Um, and so one, one direction in which we've gone is to, to apply optimal control uh, to that, and, and that has uh, had some, some success. Um, and then there's, uh, there's sort of a complementary question of if you have a partially protected qubit, um, fluxonium might actually work quite well for that. Are there different kinds of games that you can play that would uh, in fact do some sort of trade-off between T1 and T5, I should have written. Um, and and one, one concept that we found quite intriguing in this, in this uh, context is uh, we like sweet spots. Uh, sweet spots, for instance, as a function of magnetic flux, where sensitivity uh, is, is uh, killed to first order. Um, but there are, of course, not that many sweet spots. Um, there are many more sweet spots if you allow yourself to drive the system and look at dynamical sweet spots, um, which appear in a spectrum of the, of the Floquet quasi-energies. And so that's, that has been an interesting direction and has, has also led to, to a first experiment in, in Andrew Hauck's lab. And then um, there's, there's maybe one other comment before I switch to uh, a few minutes of talking about this SE qubits library in the end. Um, in, in my opinion, there, there are great opportunities and challenges for, for theorists, but, but experimentalists alike, um, because this has to do with intuitive understanding. And I, I oftentimes think that experimentalists are actually better at, uh, at developing intuition than, than theorists are definitely than, uh, than, than myself. 
Um, and so there is this whole collection of different kinds of circuits. They're, they're all still small, right? This is all four node circuits that I've drawn and they all kind of look similar. And if I ask you who is who and, and which one has protection and which one doesn't, um, I am guessing that you would have to think a little bit. Um, and and if, you, if you're really fast and have great intuition, I, I, would, like to, I would like to buy you a, a drink of your choice. Um, so, so, you know, one of them is the zero pi qubit. One of them is the cosine two phi qubit from Michel de Vare's lab. One of them is called a fluxonium molecule. One of them is called a kite fluxonium. And, and some of them are believed to have, have some uh, type of protection, some degree of protection, and, and others don't. And wouldn't it be great if we had understanding uh, and or uh, computational tools that would allow us to analyze circuits uh, in, in a manner that, that goes beyond the, the current mode of operation, which is you give me a circuit that you think could be of interest and, and I sit down for an afternoon or probably longer and try to figure out whether there is actually something interesting about it in terms of protection. Now, I will spend the last couple of minutes talking about this library, uh, which um, I'm actually quite proud of. Um, it's called SC qubits and um, it uh, does superconducting qubits in Python. Um, so it allows us to uh, do, do a variety of things. Um, uh, so, so we might want to compute energy spectra, visualize wave functions, calculate matrix elements, compute coherence times, or at least, at least estimates of them. Uh, and, and then uh, on the more advanced side, we, we probably want to be able to simply, in, a, in a, an efficient way, uh, couple multiple systems to each other, uh, perform multidimensional parameter sweeps and such. And um, th that's in fact what, what this library currently does. Um, and it's become more popular, so I think we're, we're doing the right thing. Um, so about one and a half years ago on, on Conda, uh, we had 5,300 downloads and we're now uh, pretty close to 70,000. Um, so, so there's interest out there and, and we're also interested in, in hearing from, uh, from you guys uh, what uh, works and what doesn't, whether there are things that uh, you would like to see. Here's an overview of what is currently part of the library. Um, there's a very nice um, new graphical user interface for beginners uh, that uh, is usable even if you don't have much Python programming knowledge at all. Uh, the library includes a number of qubits that, uh, that you probably recognize at this point. Um, and as I said, you can calculate all the single qubit um, spectral properties that you might want. You can very easily build up larger Hilbert spaces. So if for some reason you're interested in a system that uh, couples a transmon and a fluxonium to an oscillator, uh, and you want to figure out what is what would you see in the two-tone uh, spectroscopy, uh, we can calculate that. Um, and so I'll maybe just flash um, for the in, in the very end here what this graphical user interface looks like. Um, this was meant to be a video, and if I get, I have to switch off the laser pointer gadget one moment. Now this should, oh, and this is, Pardon me, I think I'm still in annotation mode and that is also interfering. I think now we are here, right. So let me just fast forward and give you an impression of what this looks like. So you, you see that um, there's, a, there's this nifty little user interface that allows you to look at things like energy spectrum wave functions. You can scan over matrix elements or just display matrix elements one by one. Uh, you can do that for all the qubits that are currently part of the library. And then when you uh, play with this, it's, it's quite nice that, uh, you know, you can uh, use these sliders uh, over on the right here and, and really play with parameters and explore what the different parameter regimes do to a, a qubit in terms of what do the wave functions look like? Uh, what, uh, what are the matrix elements that determine coupling to another system or uh, also coupling to spurious coupling to a bath? And so I think it's a, it's a nice little tool that, um, in fact, I've heard even from colleagues who uh, know how to program but don't really have time to program, that, that this has been very helpful to them. And um, 
if uh, if this is uh, of, of interest to you and, and you have questions, you're, you're always welcome to, to contact me or contact my, my former postdoc, Peter Kroszkowski at the University of Chicago, because we're, we're very excited and trying to extend this and, and make it work as well as we can for whatever is, is needed in the community. I'm just going to skip over all of this in the interest of time and show you one, a couple of things that we, we are working on with that. Um, so we're always in the process of uh, uh, looking at uh, different qubits that might want to become part of this library. Um, perhaps the snail is, is currently on the, the highest in our priority list. Um, and then one thing that I, I've been working on, and I'm slow because I didn't really learn uh, graphical user interface programming when I was little, but um, so, so there's this, this app uh, for which we now have a prototype where um, you, can, you can upload um, uh, two-tone spectroscopy data and, and extract individual uh, points uh, from these resonances. And then there will be a backend to SC qubits that allows you to uh, specify the coupled system that uh, is, is actually behind those data uh, and then can uh, attempt to, to fit and extract the, the actual uh, parameter values that, uh, that led to, to your data. And so with that, I would just like to say thank you. Um, those are uh, some of the people that contributed to this SC qubits library. Um, and um, if you have, uh, if, if you're aware of somebody who is uh, currently looking for a postdoc position and who is uh, interested in quantum optimal control, I would, I would love to, um, to hear from that person. Um, and um, that's really all I had for today. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm, uh, I'll be happy to answer, answer questions. Thank you very much, Jens. Let's clap for Jens for giving us a great talk on different superconducting qubits. Uh, so the floor is open for questions by the audience. I have a question. Um, very nice talk, Jens. Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I was a little bit sad to see that I didn't see you in the old pictures, but. Uh, oh, I was, I was there. You, you just didn't you recognize there? me because I still had hair. <laughs> um, wait a second. I'm, I'm the person, so, so I think this was, I think I put this picture, um, that the first dry fridge had just arrived and it was a big party with, oh, this, I, I have to do this more efficiently. Wait, wait. It was a big party that, because there were as many packing peanuts uh, as I had ever seen in my life. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm, the, I'm the guy over, over there with, with Andrew Hauck. Ah, very nice. Um, I actually had a question about the, the zero pi qubit. Um, so the soft, soft zero pi versus the deep, deep zero pi, what's the main, um, main thing that's holding us back reaching the zero pi? Is it the inductor or is it something else? It's, uh, I believe it's both, uh, both the inductor and, uh, and the question of, of uh, can you can you combine uh, the, this in, inductor uh, and and have uh, the, these large shunting capacitors at, at the same time? Um, I, I understand the part with the inductance uh, a little bit better. And and let me just uh, I'm just going to draw up uh, one more slide, perhaps that uh, is going to help explain that. Um, So this is the picture of what the experiment actually achieved. Um, and uh, so, so you see a, a, a cut through the, through the potential energy. This is the well at theta equals zero. This is the one at theta equals pi. And um, if you look at the wave functions and how they spread out along the phi direction, you see that this is really not anywhere close to the deep zero pi regime. So the, just as for fluxonium, you, you can reach flux independent uh, uh, states if you spread out over uh, a number of local wells, the same holds for zero pi, but that only takes place when the parabola that uh, is governed by your inductance is really shallow and hence the inductance is, is really large. And I believe these, these uh, junction arrays were already pretty, 
pretty large. I think um, here it says uh, e each one of them had had 200 junctions. Um, and so I, I understand that there there are limitations in in that. Um, but to to really make uh, make your wave functions flux insensitive in the way that Brooks, Kitaev and Breskill envisioned this, that's where we would have to go. Thank you. Other questions for Jens? One question I did want to ask Jens, which is uh, a little bit of a, a mixture of theory and experiment together, is this inductor technology seems to be quite challenging, right? To actually get devices that are robust. In junctions, we have quite a lot of flexibility. Do you have a winner in some sense? So there's sort of this granular aluminum lossy materials, junction arrays, all sorts of different things. So is there one particular technology you would say is more promising than others say? I think I know too little about the, the difficulties in, in fabricating anything but the junction arrays. Um, so I've, I've, seen, I've seen beautiful work uh, that, that used um, alternative technologies to make these large superinductances, but I don't think I can comment, it, comment on it from, from that perspective. I think what's, um, what's a little bit tricky about the junction arrays um, is that, well, they internally have lots of degrees of freedom, right? Um, as, as a theorist, I, I, I'm, I'm in love with the fact that uh, to, to a pretty good degree, um, I can approximate the entire array and just draw a, a classical inductance uh, and, and perform my calculation that way. Uh, but there are various places where in the experiment, uh, the internal junction, uh, the, the array modes are, are visible and, and sometimes couple in ways to our actual desired degrees of freedom that, that we don't, uh, don't really like. And, um, of course, you'll, you'll have to navigate uh, between the length of the array and where in energy all, all these modes are actually located. Uh, and so I could, uh, th that's an aspect that I, I think is, is somewhat troublesome about uh, junction arrays. Um, those but, modes are supposed to couple weekly, but I would say that in some cases, uh, I've seen cases where the, the coupling from, from spectroscopy looks stronger than I would have expected. And um, I'm not sure why that is. Yeah, that is indeed quite tricky. Uh, in some sense, it's a complicated system. And yeah. Yeah, it was interesting when Kitayev initially was talking about this many years ago, I remember him right around 2006 or a little bit earlier proposing molybdenum, germanium, or other kind of very uh, sort of disordered materials to realize these inductors. And we see granular aluminum coming online, some of these other things, but they have their own it's sort of tricky uh, issues associated with them. Good. Other. There's a yeah, fun sorry. anecdote, real quick. When you say uh, Brooks, Kitai, Preskill, and and worrying about whether something can or cannot be realized, there's this. Uh, they actually have a a statement in in their paper here. I'll bring it up on the screen, uh, which is amusing uh, to, to read as a theorist, but as an experimentalist, I would scratch my head. They, they, they say, whatever method is used, uh, reaching these, I'll shorten it, reaching these large inductances may be challenging. But in this paper, we take it for granted that a robust zero pi cubic can be realized. And from now on, we'll assume that it is perfect. Um, I don't know whether I would get away to in, in with with writing a paper uh, in this manner, but but of course uh, Preskill and Kitai if uh, can and should. But um, theorist slant is, is sometimes easier, oftentimes easier than experimental. Well, we'll have to come up with some equivalent statement as experimentalists saying that our experiment, you know, works perfectly. We leave it to the theorists to figure out the theory that explains it. Good. Uh, other questions for Jens? <laughs> so I, of course, I, I have. Don't. The, the theory is that your apparatus is broken, Irfan. I think it's been long. Is, does anything go wrong if you make the inductance really large, theoretically? Um, nothing goes wrong. The, 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 just numerically, uh, some, of the, some of the numerics becomes uh, more, more challenging, but, but not in a, in a fundamental way. Um, and, and in fact, um, the... To, to reach the regime where 
this photon shot noise defacing uh, is, is not a problem anymore, it does require these extreme values of very large inductance. Uh, okay, so then I guess a follow up to that is if I look back at the zero psi circuit, if I just like remove the inductors and I have like two, two, two junctions which are then capacitively coupled on each side, what is the, how do I think about this limiting case? Uh, oh, oh, this is this is a this is a very subtle question, and I see Gerwin smiling because it's a question that in in meetings we've we've uh, just recently discussed. Um, so the limit of sending the inductance to infinity is is not exactly the same uh, as as just removing the inductor. Um, I, I could talk about this forever, but but maybe the first thing that that I will just point out at so if whatever the value of the of the inductance is, as long as it's finite, no matter how large, I have a DC connection, right? And that is in a way different from actually removing the inductor entirely. Okay, very good. Long, you had a question. Uh, okay, maybe a philosophical questions for James, uh, which he can use to enlighten all of us. Um, so when I think about quantum computing, uh, you know, I think about qubits that are coupled to each other and you can do operation between them and to the qubit itself. So let's say that I have something that is uh, so protected. Uh, what is the point of such a protected space if you cannot control it or couple it to other things? And if let's say that uh, I can couple and control them using like unprotected state, then the gate is limited. It, the gate itself is limited by the, you know, the coherence uh, somewhere else. So then, uh, what is the point of having a, a protected subspace if you cannot uh, directly uh, use this high coherence, high T1, T2 to lift up the limitation on your gate with everything? I think that's a very good question. I don't think it's philosophical. Um, I, I remember talking with, with John Martinez a while ago and uh, he, he, uh, he, he, he called, he, he referred to what you're describing, I think, as, as neutrino-fying your, your qubit, right? Uh, if, if, if your qubit is like a neutrino, it's, it's fantastically coherent, but you can't do anything with it, then indeed, what's, what's the point? Um, and uh, I, I think it's absolutely right that there's, uh, there's some sort of compromise, right? Um, too, too much protection in the sense of inability to, to access the qubit uh, is not going to work. Um, now, is it true that a well-protected qubit for, for which I have to uh, reduce protection temporarily is, is, uh, is, is pointless? I think not. Um, I, I would imagine that um, not, not every qubit, as you, as you imagine a, a larger device um, and, and performing an algorithm, not, not every qubit undergoes gates at every instance, right? And so uh, I, I think um, that there may well be a, a scenario, if, if you want the extreme, uh, I, I, could, I could refer to, to some qubits as memory qubits. Um, I, I actually think that that's maybe a little bit too extreme. Um, but, but there may well be a, a trade-off that you can play in terms of how much protection uh, is, is good um, and that will have to be balanced with, uh, well, uh, how, what, what is your ability to do uh, reasonably fast and, and high fidelity gates? So would you say that uh, having a protected qubit is half of the story and the other story is that you, uh, you have to realize this type of somewhat protected gate? Oh yeah, ab absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, that, that, that's in part why, why we uh, mm -hmm. started working on optimal control. And uh, uh, there's one paper out that indeed looks at um, how to go through higher lying levels of the zero pi qubit uh, to, to actually uh, perform, perform gates. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's not trivial, um, by which I don't mean uh, the, the theory part. Um, I, I just mean that uh, it, it's, 
it's tricky because indeed uh, this this protection comes at the price that you know the environment uh, has it, uh, it, it it's difficult for the environment to talk to your qubit uh, but it's also more difficult for you when you say memory qubits uh, what type of protection would you need because i would think you need both t1 and t2 for it to be a good memory a absolutely absolutely I, I i would want both yes i i just mentioned memory qubits with um sort of alluding to to the picture that if it's a memory qubit, it's it's meant to sit there for a good while. It's it's not the thing that undergoes gates uh, all the time. Okay, very good. Uh, any last quick questions for Jens? So looks like the story is getting deeper. We need we need the gates. We need the semi-protected gates. We need to have optimal control through the space, and we need the qubit. Quantum computing is hard. <laughs> very good. All right. So if no last questions. We will let Jens go. He's getting late uh, on your side. Thank you again for, for a wonderful talk. We, we learned a lot. And I hope we continue the discussion going with the uh, GKP or other type of qubits and things that the team is looking for. Let's uh, clap once more for Jens. Thank you, Monica, also for arranging everything. And I wish everyone a good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you very much. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.